Well, we're studying the Psalms and we're on lesson number two, teach us to pray. Let's suppose that you were transported back in time to the church at Colossia and you were going to attend a worship service where the Apostle Paul was going to speak. And before that worship service, there was singing. What songbook do you think they would sing praises and pray out of? We don't have to guess. The Bible tells us. Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look there at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You and I could imagine the ancient Christians in the first century singing the psalms. I can almost hear them singing, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I can almost hear them singing Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose iniquity is covered. You know, you can almost imagine them singing a psalm like Psalm 91. Though a thousand fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, it shall not come nigh thee. Songs about God is refuge and strength and defender. In fact, the Apostle James talks too about singing the Psalms, the Psalms in worship. James 5 verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. So you can almost imagine going to church and hearing the cheerful voices of these early Christians singing the Psalms. Now, praying the Psalms has helped many believers establish and maintain regular and fulfilling prayer lives. How do you do this? Well, I suggest, and our lesson, I think, brings out a good point. You start with Psalm 1. Don't worry about a speed reading course. But each day, read a psalm. I'm personally, as I mentioned in our last Sabbath school lesson, I'm reading five psalms every morning. Reading that psalm, now when I come to Psalm 119, which has, you know, 160 some odd verses, 170 verses, I won't be reading five psalms that morning. But read a psalm and pray through that psalm as you read it. As you feel impressed with a thought, speak your words out to God. As you feel moved by the Spirit to to give God praise, give Him praise. As you feel moved by the Spirit to make a request to God, make that request. If you feel moved by the Spirit to ask God to help you overcome anxiety and fear, do that. Read the psalm, engaging in simple reflections. Meditate upon the psalm. Ask yourself, what was David going through or what was the psalmist who wrote this psalm going through? Then put yourself in their place. What indeed are you currently going through? Now, sometimes you're going to read a psalm that doesn't really resonate with you. Other times you're going to read a psalm that says, wow, It's exactly what I needed for this particular day. But focus on the use of Psalms in prayer. I like what our lesson says. It says uh, in about the middle paragraph, page 13, if you're following along in your lesson uh, quarterly, Sunday's lesson, January 7. First, read the Psalm, engaging in simple reflection, and then pray. Ruminate. What's that mean, ruminate? Meditate over the psalm, and uh, that involves reflection on the various aspects of the psalm, the way the psalmist addresses God, the reasons for the prayer. Consider how your situation corresponds to the psalmist's experience and how this psalm might be able to help you 
in your own experience. So make the Psalms personal. So let's look through this week in this week's lesson and let's look through some of the Psalms and how they speak to us. Monday's lesson is Trust in Times of Trouble and it focuses particularly on Psalm 44. So let's go to Psalm 44 and let's take a look at that in the light of our devotional experience. Psalm 44. It's a quite a, a lengthy psalm, 26 verses, and uh, it, is, it begins, We've heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what deeds you did in their days and days of old, how you drove out the nations with your hand. Now, as I'm reading that, what am I thinking about? I'm saying, God, when Israel faced major challenges and difficulties, you were there. You were there to drive out their enemies. Lord, I'm facing some difficulties. I'm facing some challenges. You can work powerfully in my life as well. Verse 4, you are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we'll push down our enemies. Through your name we'll trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. So as I'm reading that psalm, I'm saying to myself, Lord, whatever forces come against me today, whatever evil powers try to impact my life today, God in you, I'm going to boast all day long. And um, the, the psalm concludes, Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. So in Monday's lesson, we find a psalm that is a psalm of trust in a time of trouble. God is our vindicator. God's our deliverer. God's our protector. And we praise him. Um, here in the lesson, it, the last paragraph says, notice, however, how Psalm 44 begins. The writer is talking about how in the past God has done great things for his people. Hence, the author expresses his trust in God, not in his bow, not in his weapons. Despite this, trouble still comes upon God's people. The list of woe and lament is long and painful. However, even amid all this, the psalmist cries out for God to deliver to redeem us for his mercy's sake, even in the midst of trouble. The psalmist knows the reality of God and his love. I want you to keep that in mind. In the Psalms, we do not find the idea that if we are faithful to God, we're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. We don't find that in the Psalms. We find in the Psalms, there are going to be ups and there are going to be downs. Sometimes we're going to be on the mountain peak, Sometimes we're going to walk through the valley of despair. Sometimes in the Psalms, we're going to be jubilant and cheerful, and sometimes we'll face discouragement. Sometimes we'll have great victories in the Psalms, sometimes defeat. But whatever we are going through does not change the reality of the fact that God is a God of love, He cares for us, He's sovereign, and He'll never leave us or forsake us. Um, so in Tuesday's lesson, we have a psalm of despair. Now, it's Psalm 22. Now, in Psalm 22, these are the words that Christ uttered on the cross of Calvary. You'll recognize them immediately in Psalm 22. It's a psalm of suffering, a psalm of praise. So Jesus memorized the psalms as a child. He sensed in Psalm 22 that the psalmist was speaking about his experience. And so, look, Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. This Jesus il illustrate this on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, the weight of the sin of the world was so great. The condemnation of sin was so great. The guilt of sin of every human being that had ever lived was bearing down upon Christ. And when it was, 
Darkness enshrouded him. He could not see himself coming through the doors or the portals of the tomb. He thought he may be separated from the Father forever. And so he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those were the very words of the psalmist in Psalm 22. But then, verse 3, you are holy, who inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted and were not ashamed. So here, David is saying, God, sometimes I feel forsaken, just like Jesus did on the cross. But God is still there. And he said, our fathers, that is the patriarchs, the prophets of the Old Testament, they trusted and they were delivered. They trusted and they were not ashamed. But as you go down through this psalm, you see the words of Christ again. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. This is Jesus on the cross. In all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. Dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. Well, let's pause there. They pierced my hands and feet. Here is a psalm that a thousand years before Christ in the days of David predicts the crucifixion of Christ. They pierce my hands and feet. Now, in David's day, the crucifixion did not exist. Crucifixion was introduced by the Romans, and um, it was practiced by the Romans' armies as they attacked and overthrew their enemies. In fact, when Rome overthrew Sparta, it was said that there were crosses all the way along the road into Sparta, hundreds of crosses where the Spartans, the Romans defeated, were crucified. So we find here in this psalm a prediction of an event that was not yet reality in David's day because capital punishment in David's day, of course, was stoning or hanging uh, by a noose to a tree. But here we find David predicting the crucifixion of Christ. You know, when you look at Jesus, he's more than a good man, more than an ethical philosopher, more than a religious teacher. But the prophecies of the Old Testament, that he would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2, born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, as Zechariah tells us, crucified, as David tells us. All these prophecies point forward to the fact that Jesus is the divine Son of God. Look, he says, they pierce my hands and feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. I mean, again, a fulfillment of prophecy. If in John 11, you remember verse 25, it talks about them playing for Jesus' garments, playing dice for Jesus' garments. So Psalm 22 is a psalm of despair, but it's a psalm that speaks of Christ and his prophecies of Christ. But you look at Psalm 22, verse 22, even in that despair, what do we find? I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I'll praise you. So David's going through despair. His despair is a microcosm of what Christ would go through on the cross. And even then, David cries out that he is going to, going to praise God. So there are going to be times when we have feelings very similar to this. God, where are you? God, you've forsaken me. We're going to have times in our own lives when God is silent. But yet... Yet, we can look at the Psalms and find that the psalmist went through very, very similar experiences. I, in the second to last paragraph, I read, Praying the Psalms thus takes worshipers to a new spiritual horizon. The Psalms let worshipers express their feelings and understandings, but they're not left where they presently are. Can you say, praise God? We can express our feelings, despair, discouragement, but the Psalms don't leave us there. 
the worshipers are led to abandon their burdens of pain and disappointment, anger and despair before God, to trust in Him, whatever their experiences. There is a movement of lament to praise observed in many Psalms, and that's suggestive of the spiritual transformation that believers experience when they receive divine grace and comfort in prayer. So look for that in the Psalms, this, this movement. And that leads us to Wednesday's lesson from despair to hope. We find that in Psalm 13, this idea of despair to hope. And it's only six verses. So let's go through the whole verse, the whole Psalm 13, chapter by ch verse by verse. So, that, so David starts out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? So, I mean, that's, that's filled with despair. God, where are you? You, you? It's lament, isn't it? How long will you hide your face from me? Lament. How long will I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? So David is saying, God, where are you? God, it seems like you've forgotten me. God, I'm filled with lament and despair. Verse 3, consider and hear me, O God. Enlighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He's saying, look, my, my, I'm so weak, I'm going to sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I prevailed against him. Let those who trouble me rejoice when I move. But, you know, where are you, God? But. How long are you going to hide your face from me, God? But. How long will my soul take counsel and I won't hear your voice? But. But what? But I've trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. I mean, that psalm moves from despair to hope. It moves from sorrow to joy. It moves from being in the dark valley to being on the mountain peak. It ends with this glorious refrain, I will sing because the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. We find that constantly throughout the Psalms. The Psalm leads us to deliberately choose to trust God's redemptive power so that our fear and anxiety can gradually give way to God's salvation. We begin experiencing change from lament to praise, from despair to hope. Now, when praying the Psalms, we should seek the Holy Spirit to guide us to act in the way demanded by the Psalms. The Psalms are the Word of God by which believers' actions and characters are transformed, not simply informed, by God's grace. The promises of the Psalms are made manifest in the lives of believers. This means we allow God's word to shape us according to God's will and to unite us with Christ, who demonstrated God's will perfectly as the incarnate Son of God. And Jesus, of course, prayed the Psalms as well. As we read the Psalms, we read about how God wants to restore us into his image. We read about how God wants to remake us us. A good example of that is Psalm 60, verse 1 to 5. This Psalm 60, verse 1 to 5, is a psalm that speaks of how God casts us off, or we turn our backs on him in sin, but how God wants to restore us to his image. Listen, oh God, you've cast us off, you've broken us down, You've been displeased. Oh, restore us again. You made the earth tremble. You've broken it. Heal its breaches for its shaking. You've shown your people hard things. You've made us drink the wine of confusion. You've given us a banner to those who fear you. Give us help from trouble. Verse 11. For vain is the help of man. Through God we'll do valiantly. For it is he who will tread down our enemies. In other words, here's a psalm of restoration where you start out in the psalm where we've displeased God, but he's going to restore us. He's going to renew his image within us. His power is going to work in our lives. And we are going to do valiantly through God. There are two major things in the Psalms that I want to emphasize as this particular lesson comes to a close. First, they make us more aware that suffering is part of the general human experience. It happens to the righteous and the wicked. The Psalms assure us that God's in control and provides strength and solution in the time of trouble. That is a key point, that 
when we go through difficulties and challenges, it's not that we're off the map. It's not that we've run off the road someplace. We don't, it's because we live in a wicked, sinful world. It's not that God forsakes us when we're in trouble. It's rather that he is still in control, drawing us to himself. Secondly, the lament Psalms teach us compassion towards sufferers. When expressing our happiness and gratitude to God, especially in public, we must be mindful of the less fortunate. Sure, we might have good things right now, but who doesn't know of people all around us who are suffering terribly? So these Psalms do two specific things. Let me summarize them. First, they show us the reality of living in a sinful world and the reality that as we go through pain and suffering, God is with us, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. Secondly, the Psalms teach us to be compassionate. They teach us to care for others going through suffering. They make us more tender to others who are experiencing that suffering. Ellen White describes David's penitent Psalms as the language of his soul and prayers that illustrate the nature of true sorrow. She encourages believers to memorize texts from the Psalms as a means of fostering a sense of God's presence in their lives and highlights Jesus' practice of lifting his voice with Psalms when met with temptation. Then she says, this is very interesting, you find this in the book Education, pages 162 through 168, there's a wonderful section there where she says, how often by words of holy song are unsealed in the soul springs of penance and faith, of hope and of love and joy. So as you read the Psalms, personalize the Psalms. As you read the Psalms, drink in the blessing of God. As you read the Psalms, let your heart soar in praise and jubilation. As you read the Psalms, grasp the reality that God is your defender. God is your refuge. God is your rock. God is your fortress. God is your shepherd that you can hide under his wings of protection. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts that we can grasp the reality that whatever we go through in life, you're there. You're there to guide us, to strengthen us, to encourage us. And Father, we're thankful that as we read the Psalms, we read about real life. Help us to echo your words back to you through the Psalms in prayer and teach us through these Psalms to be compassionate to others. In Christ's name, amen.